What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of exciting news to go over here this week. But first, real quick, I'm gonna give a quick shout out to my buddy Anthony Alonzo's new book, uh, Mustang Bullet Generation. So I'm not getting paid to say this, but um, he did this really cool new book on all the generations of the bullet. And uh, it's really fascinating because it actually goes through uh, interviews with the people that engineered these cars and the the reasons why they made the choices they did. So, I mean, even for the 2019, for example, if you're in or one of those. It explains why they did the wheels the way they did. It shows how they mixed the Highland Green paint and the shade that they went with for the car and why they went with that color. And just so many cool little you know tidbits and things, the things that I didn't even know about the car. Um, like for example, the uh, fastback roof line is actually the same angle as it is on a 67 or a 68. Just like all kinds of really fascinating things in this book. And so I learned a bunch and I'm sure you will as well if you want to check it out. They even have a little feature on yours truly in here um, and just the small role that the channel played in promoting the bullet and uh, so very cool to be actually featured in a book that's the first time I've ever been featured in a book and uh, it's just a very well done very high quality book so I'll have a link in the description below if you want to check it out again I'm not getting paid to say this I'm not getting any kickbacks I just think it's a genuinely cool book and I know many of you are bullet owners or bullet fans so I wanted to bring that to your attention but anyway moving on to the uh, weekly update here uh, another fourth thing though uh, the first big news this week is the 2021 F-150 has been revealed. So Ford is saying it is all new. There are some reports that it's still on the same platform, but I know the track and a few of the other things have changed uh, under the body, so I'm not 100% certain on that. But what you can see is that the exterior has been totally reworked. Every panel, they say, is new. But as you can see, it's definitely a conservative evolutionary design. Um, but you know, since this is the best-selling vehicle in America, I don't really blame them for not changing it a whole lot. Uh, but as far as um, the actual content of this vehicle, um, the biggest addition I think is there's this new power boost hybrid powertrain. And so there aren't any specs listed for it yet, but it combines the three and a half liter EcoBoost engine with a 47 horsepower electric motor and a 1.5 kilowatt battery uh, that they claim um, they're targeting the most torque and horsepower in its class. They're also uh, targeting a 12,000 pound towing capacity for this model and also a targeted EPA range of 700 miles on a tank of gas which is pretty crazy. There's also many other things that help give it that better fuel economy, such as active grill shutters and active air dam, and um, this new design, which they say is a little bit more aerodynamic than it was before as well. The interior is also very impressive, and I think that's honestly where the biggest leaps have been made. So um, there's improved materials, more storage spaces, a couple cool innovations they have, like there's these max recline seats that uh, now actually allow you to lay them down flat and will actually adjust um, the uh, all the you know the bolstering of the seat and everything in order to you know make it a good place to lay down there. Um, and other things there is going to be a fold-out work surface that actually causes the gear shifter to be stowed away in a kind of hides away there um, so that you can lay that down so you can you know put a laptop on there sign documents all that kind of stuff um, there's also a lockable rear under storage area um, just all kinds of you know new things on the tech side it has a fully digital gauge cluster that's available now that's 12 inches there's also an available 12 inch landscape oriented infotainment display that runs the new sync 4 software and has over the air updates as well as wireless apple carplay and android auto, auto now which is really great it'll come on higher XLT trims and above um, and then there's going to be an 8 inch touchscreen is going to be standard on the uh, lower versions of the XLT and lower models beneath that. There's also an 8 speaker B&O sound system as well as an optional 18 speaker B&O system which is like the B&O play they used to call it. It's Bang & Olufsen but um, not as high quality as a full blown Bang & Olufsen system but this 18 speaker one sounds pretty impressive. It's going to have speakers in the headliner and in the front headrest as well as all over the rest of the vehicle. Um, there's also going to be be Ford's Copilot 360 driver assistance tech available along with trailer reverse guidance cameras and um, you know all kinds of tech like that as well. There's also a ton of other features such as an onboard generator. There's uh, You can customize the lighting. Um, there's all kinds of tricks in the truck bed. There's even a built-in bottle opener they're saying um, with the tie downs there in the truck bed and things like that. And so all kinds of cool innovations and uh, they say these are going to be available this fall. So cool to see that. Another a little Ford 
third news that I do want to mention is a correction about the GT500 convertible that was spied last week. So that was spied, and uh, thanks to Trevor, uh, Trev6667, um, who sent that in to me. And so, um, you know, he sent those in, and they were very blurry, but he was actually able to see um, this car again in Dearborn, Michigan, and got some better pictures of it last week. And as you can see, it's actually a dealer plate, not a manufacturer plate. And there's been some other people actually posted this up on the Mustang 6G forum, and some others have weighed in, and like the brakes look like they're not the large Brembos from the GT500. Um, the silver, uh, shade of silver, looks like it's a normal Mustang silver and not the iconic silver that you get on the GT500. Um, and a few other minor things that don't look quite right on this car. So um, it might be the very first very convincing GT500 convertible knockoff that someone has, you know, put a real GT500 hood, real, T real GT500 front end on it, um, and, uh, you know, put some Shelby badges on a convertible GT or something and made this. But I think that is probably what this is. The dealer plate and the fact it's in, dealer, it's in Dearborn, Michigan, makes me think that maybe Ford could have helped them out with building this you know, maybe by supplying the parts or something, because um, I doubt someone's going to be hacking up a GT500 to make something like this. Um, so, but I'm not sure 100% what it is, but I'm fairly certain since it doesn't have a manufacturer plate that it probably isn't an official Ford thing. So sorry to disappoint any of you who are excited about a GT500 convertible. They still might do it someday. We'll have to wait and see. They have done it in the past. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to you know correct that. Um, but getting back to some truck news here, Ram has officially teased the Ram T-Rex this week, and they say it's going to be debuting later this summer. Um, and that's all the official info we have. It's just there's a little teaser video of it spinning around in the dirt. You can't see anything and it sounds like a v8 which no surprise there we know it's going to probably have the hellcat motor um but i do have a little bit more info on it actually thanks to a source that uh, wishes to remain anonymous but i believe is credible and so um they have given me a little bit of info about the t-rex they're saying that it uh, because it'll have um the hellcat motor um it's going to be pretty crazy and they say that it's going to really you know destroy uh the raptor as far as competition and stuff but uh they also claim that the frame and suspension are race truck stuff with trophy truck shocks and they even suggest um, it's it's going to be like really over the top and because of that uh, they're claiming the price is going to be around a hundred thousand dollars that sounds kind of high maybe for a maxed out fully loaded one but even a fully maxed out ram is like 70 grand and okay you throw the hellcat motor in throw up another five thousand put in all the trophy truck stuff or whatever, another five. Maybe you get to, you know, 80 or 90, 100 sounds like a really big leap, but, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see. That's just what the, that they were thinking here. Um, but anyway, that's very promising if that's uh, what it sounds like. Apparently, they're going to come out swinging with this Ram T-Rex. It's not just going to be a Ram that has some off-road stuff and Hellcat motor. It's going to be legit, it sounds like. Um, also, a few other things that this source has given me some info on. They're also claiming that a new Ram Charger is coming in 2022 based on the 1500 platform. Um, and this is something, there was an April Fool's thing put out about a Ram Charger, and everyone's like, oh, Ram Charger is fake. Um, but this person seems to insist that this is a real thing coming for the 2022 calendar year um, and they say it's going to have removable roof and doors um, which is pretty interesting for a ram um, so not sure about any other details but that's just all they gave me on that um, they also were mentioning there's going to be a body on frame ram suv uh, that's going to be based on the coming wagoneer it's supposed to compete with the tahoe and the suburban so think of this as you know again kind of what you get with the expedition and stuff like that i think dodge wants to compete with the ram i think the, the durango is a little bit too small to really compete with stuff like the expedition so i think that's why ram wants to do their own thing and you probably will still have the durango that will share stuff with the grand cherokee and be you know a little bit more unibody and stuff, not the body on frame thing. But I think they're going to really go big with this huge, you know, Ram SUV. And so they're claiming that's, again, going to share stuff with the Wagoneer. And it makes sense to, you know, not only have a Jeep version, but also to do a Ram version for those who don't want the Jeep time kind of look and stuff. Um, but anyway... That they're saying is supposedly arriving next year. And there have been spy shots, which I can't show because I don't have the rights to them, but there are some spy shots of some very large uh, Mopar vehicles that kind of look like they're, you know, Yukon and, uh, you know, suburban sized and stuff like that. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but I believe this stuff's pretty credible. Uh, but, you know, we'll, of course, have to just wait and see what materializes. 
Um, for some other official teasers here, uh, there's a teaser from Mazda that's a little bit exciting. Um, they reveal this in this teaser video, um, this title is Prepare for Launch and it consists of some revving and a July 8th reveal date. And so, obviously everyone wants to jump to saying this is a Mazda, th Mazda Speed 3 and that's what everyone wants it to be. Um, and thanks to Eric, Rose, Ro Eric Rostern for the heads up on this. Um, but the video is currently unlisted on Mazda's pace. They're kind of uh, hiding it a little bit. Uh, but the description just says, we're starting our engines, get ready. And then they reveal that uh, yeah, July 8th is when they're going to be showing this, whatever it is. Um, and uh, it, I just hope they're not hyping this up for it to just be a 2.5T signature version of the Mazda 3. Because um, previously, a couple of months back, you know, there was some dealer Intel. It looked like in the dealer system, there was a Mazda, a Mazda 3 2.5T, and it was going to be all-wheel drive only, and it was going to be automatic transmission only. So not an enthusiast thing. Just basically think of it as, you know, a Mazda CX-5 with that turbo motor um, and that all-wheel drive system just thrown into the Mazda 3 and it's going to be no sportier than that. That's kind of the, the safe bet. I really hope they do something of above and beyond and the fact that they're teasing this and talking about launching and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, it sounds like, you know, it could be something a little bit sportier. I hope they at least have like a, just a sport package or some type of, you know, better suspension setup or something for someone who doesn't want it to just be a luxury car. Um, so we'll have to see, uh, but that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and hopefully we'll have some more news to report here in another, you know, week and a half or two weeks. Porsche this week has announced the Cayman GTS 4.0 and Boxer GTS 4.0 are going to be getting a PDK transmission to go along with the manual transmission, depending on, you know, whatever you prefer. So previously it was just rolled out with the manual and there was rumors of a PDK and now that has been confirmed. So, um, yeah, it's going to be, uh, the manuals are going to be coming first, but then, um, uh, they're saying that the PDKs are going to be coming a few months later in early 2021 versus uh, late 2020 for the manual versions. But they also, along with this announcement, revealed the pricing, which is going to be starting at $88,150 for the Cayman and $90,250 for the Boxster. Man, I know these are like the top, you know, collector's versions of the Boxster and Cayman kind of, aside from the GT4 and the Spider. But man, 90 grand for a Boxster is crazy. I remember when you can get a really nice 911 for 90 grand. And... <laughs> That uh, seems like a distant memory at this point. It's just crazy how Porsches are just skyrocketing in price. Um, but anyway, yeah, so these are going to be arriving towards the end of this year, early next. Um, and also, all Caymans and Boxers for 2021 will be getting a standard two-zone climate control system, heated front seats, auto-dimming mirrors, rain-sensing wipers, Apple CarPlay, and a bi-Xenon Porsche Dynamic light system. Uh, it's going to all be standard as well um, on those lower models as well, which are going to be you know starting in the low 60s. Um, so interesting to see that. Volkswagen has also revealed a refresh here for the 2021 Arteon, and uh, it's a minor refresh. You know, it's got a sportier front end now with an expanded LED light bar on the R-Line models that kind of goes to the Volkswagen badge there. There's also new taillights, wheels, and colors. But that's about the extent of the exterior stuff. On the inside, though, it gets the new Volkswagen steering wheel design. The digital cockpit is now standard, and the 8-inch touchscreen now has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, along with a wireless charging pad now being available too, which is nice. There's also a redesigned climate control area with capacitive touch sliders instead of knobs now, so that's a little more futuristic. Um, they also got rid of the analog clock, so they really did a good job, I think, now finally differentiating this from other Volkswagens and making it a little bit more uh, futuristic and uh, moving the ball forward a little bit from the dated Volkswagen interior design we've seen in everything for years and years. Um, the ambient lighting also looks to be expanded onto the doors a little bit, and Volkswagen says the materials have improved inside as well. Um, mechanically, it's all the same and the powertrain hasn't changed for the version here in the United States. I already did a review on the Arteon if you want to hear all my thoughts on how it drives. Um, but those of you lucky Europeans uh, are going to have the option of now getting an Arteon R, which will even be coming in a shooting brake version as well as the standard shooting brake versions of the Arteon, which you'll be able to get in Europe. We're not getting either the shooting brake or the R here in the States because Volkswagen just doesn't like us, I guess, or we just don't buy enough of them, whatever. Uh, but the 
Arteon R, for those of you in Europe, will be doing 315 horsepower and 310 pound-feet of torque from the Golf R's 2-liter turbo 4-cylinder, and it runs it through the same 7-speed dual-clutch automatic. Uh, 0 to 60 is going to be about 5 seconds on that one, and it runs a torque vectoring all-wheel drive system, bigger brakes, adaptive suspension, all kinds of goodies. Um, it even comes, like I said, with that shooting brake version, um, which is a pretty sweet combo, I think. But anyway, uh, back to reality here in the States. Our standard regular 2021 Arteon will be arriving at dealers in November, they say, but they don't have any pricing yet. Lamborghini has partially revealed their new track hypercar, the SCV12. And so I won't go into the details of this too much because it's not street legal and it's super rare. They're only, you know, building 40 of these things. But um, it runs the events in order's naturally aspirated V12, but it's been pumped up to do uh, 830 horsepower thanks partially to better breathing through a roof scoop that Lamborghini says creates a supercharging effect due to the extra air that's being shoved into that thing at higher speed. And so I guess it um, kind of it just forces more air in there and it makes more power. That seems interesting, but uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool um, you know setup there. And they're going to have a full reveal later this summer. But again, super rare, super limited. Maybe some of this new body styling will you know um, turn up on a new uh, you know version of the Aventador, you know the next generation uh, V12 hyper, supercar, whatever they call it. But um, anyway, interesting to see that. Uh, for something polar opposite, Kia has revealed a couple images of their new minivan, uh, the next generation Sedona, um, which is called the Carnival in South Korea. And uh, sadly, we only have a couple images here, no pictures of the interior, no actual details or real info. Um, but all I can say is right now it looks very sharp for a minivan, has Range Rover inspired looks there. And I gotta say the Carnival name sounds a lot better than Sedona in my opinion too. I wish the Carnival name would come over here. Kia Carnival kind of just rolls off the tongue nicely. Um, but anyway, it's gonna be on sale in South Korea this fall and could arrive here by the end of this year or early next. Um, and hopefully we get more info on that soon. Uh, Jaguar has revealed a light refresh for the iPace for the 2021 model year. So exterior wise, it mostly just comes down to new wheels and colors along with options for a bright pack or a black pack. Um, the, it gets the biggest changes though on the inside here, starting with a new camera rear view mirror from the Evoque and the Pivi Pro infotainment system from the Defender along with revised digital gauges. One interesting thing though about this new infotainment software is in addition to its streamlined interface that they say is better and faster to boot up and stuff, um, the navigation system will learn parts of your route that you drive often and will actually silence itself automatically during those parts like leaving your neighborhood or you know if you're doing a lot of the stuff that you know how to get home um, from a certain point, it will stop talking whenever it knows that you probably know your way home at this point instead of you having to go over and cancel it or whatever. So that's really cool that it does that. Um, it's also going to be sounding better thanks to a new Meridian stereo that gets two more speakers. Um, and the iPace now also charges faster thanks to an upgrade from the 7 kilowatt charger to an 11 kilowatt charger on board, which can do a full charge in 8.6 hours instead of the previous 12.75 hours that it used to do. It can still charge faster, of course, on public charging uh, networks where I think it does, you know, the 50 uh, kilowatt fast charging. Um, but anyway, um, hopefully that helps the iPace to do a little bit better. I know they don't sell very well and the discounts on them are massive right now. I think my local dealer was knocking like 10 grand off the MSRP of an iPace just to move it. Uh, I mean, they are getting some pretty heavy discounts. I think some places I've even seen like 15 or 20 grand off an iPace. So um, they're desperate to move these things. I've heard they're not very reliable, which is sad if it's true. Um, um, but I think the iPace is still cool and I hope that it um, you know does better for Jaguar here in the future. And there's a new report this week by Auto Forecast Solutions that claims that they've been told by multiple sources that the Ford Edge is going to be discontinued by 2023 and that the Lincoln Nautilus could go along with it as well. Um, but they say that both the Edge and the Nautilus production could continue in China because um, there are already factories built for the Edge in China that builds those for the Chinese market. And so the Nautilus could go there as well if they you know deem that it's you know, something they want to do. But um, Ford has denied these rumors about the edge and the Nautilus going away. Um, and with almost 140,000 edges sold last year alone, I mean, they sell a ton of edges, so it kind of doesn't seem like, you know, that'd be a smart move to get rid of it. Um, but, you know, with Ford's 
SUV only approach, you know, they're just going to have a ton of SUVs coming. And so maybe they want to clear out a little bit of room, you know, because they're going to have the Bronco Sport, the Bronco and the mach all kind of in that similar, um, you know, segment as well as having the Escape and the Explorer. And the Explorer is only like, I think, 1500 bucks more expensive than an Edge. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people just jump up to that or something. I don't know. But um, I think for Lincoln, it would open up a pretty big hole in their lineup because you have the Corsair, which is based on the Escape and pretty small. And then you have the Aviator based on the Explorer and there isn't really anything that's a a smaller uh, two row you know truck based SUV or something like that and so I think the Nautilus even though it is you know a unibody thing just you know obviously based on the edge I think there could still be a space for a large thing like the Nautilus so I think maybe the Nautilus would stick around we'll just have to wait and see Um, you know there is also Lincoln's you know working on an electric SUV uh, that could just be a Lincoln version of the Mach-E since they kind of have put their Rivion deal on the back burner for now and so we'll have to wait and see what happens with all that but um It'll be interesting to see, you know, if they actually do kill it off. Even if it is 2023, that's still several years away, so we'll have to wait and see. Lots of things can change in that time period, as we've seen with uh, just how 2020 has gone so far. So anyway, uh, just an interesting report there. And lastly here this week, there's two cars that uh, did officially get discontinued this week. First is the Bentley Mulsen. Um, the final cars rolled off the line this week, and that means its engine is also going away, which is that classic 6.75 liter V8 that was the Bentley powerhouse for decades in so many cars. Um, and the Mulsen has been around since 2009, and just only 7,300 of those were built in that time. So they're still really rare, even compared with all the Lamborghini Huracans and stuff out there. I mean, they made way less of the Mulsanne, so um, much more rare and uh, pretty prestigious. And the Flying Spur is now going to take the top spot. And um, obviously, I think the Flying Spur is a lot nicer with the new Continental GT interior it has and everything else. Um, And a similar amount of space to the Mulsanne, it seems. So... Now, kind of a bummer that they're getting rid of that, uh, but, uh, you know, had a good run, I suppose. The other car to get killed off that did not have a very long run was the uh, Toyota Yaris just got killed off here. And they say there will not be a 2021 model to your vehicle. 2020 will be the last for the Mazda-built Yaris here in the States. Those of you in Europe and the rest of the world get a brand new Yaris already. That's safe and that's sticking around. It's just this, you know, kind of uh, interesting thing that uh, Mazda and Toyota combined on here with this Yaris here for the States. And uh, it's kind of of funny because the hatchback just debuted here for the 2020 model year and i have a review coming on the hatchback here this weekend which is kind of funny that uh, now they've just killed it off after the first model year for that hatch here um so it's a little bit of a bummer so you'll be able to watch a discontinued car uh review that's brand new still uh this weekend which is kind of the first time that's ever happened um but anyway it just kind of you know even though i mean you'll see in the review it's a nice little car for what it is honestly it's just the fact that in that segment there is it's just the price difference between that and a corolla is so small that most people just rather buy a one-year-old used Corolla for the same money or spend the extra, you know, one or two thousand dollars to spring up to a Corolla instead. Um, and, you know, the Corolla is just so much more powerful, more roomy, and far nicer inside than the uh, Yaris was um, for, again, just that tiny little price bump. It just makes sense to go up to the Corolla, I think, for most people. And so even though the Yaris was a solid car and they'll be very solid and probably run forever, um, it's just, uh, you know, the way things are, you know, people just get more money, more car for less money. And uh, the sales numbers don't lie either. I mean, they sold less than 22,000 Yaris's in the U.S. last year compared with nearly 305,000 Corollas that were sold last year. So there you have it. Um, that's all you need to know right there as far as why the Yaris is getting killed off. Um, it's a shame because there are some people who really, you know, need some more affordable stuff under $20,000. But again, there's always the used market, I guess. Um, And so anyway, interesting to see that. But yes, that's it for all the news this week, guys. So let me know your thoughts and everything in the comments below. Thank you guys very much for watching. Please continue to stay safe and healthy. I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.